I want to show how to teach the entire biblical narrative in about five minutes. I always tell my students that you can give folks an overview of the Old and the New Testament in essentially any amount of time allotted. I have resources. My Bible study invitation does it over 10 weeks. Uh, my book, Realigning with God, you can read the biblical narrative. But I think it's really important that we also have a really short version of how to describe the Bible simply to give folks handles or even hangers, if you will, that they can then read the smaller pieces within the scripture. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to give this a shot. We'll see if we can do this in five minutes. Now, a couple of comments on there. First of all, the key is to note that I've divided the, the Bible up into blocks of time. We have creation, and it's super important to note that the scriptures begin with the creation of everything that exists, and then creation moves towards a new creation, a new heaven, a new earth. You go from the Garden of Eden to a new Jerusalem. So first of all, we want to notice that the Bible has a big frame. It moves from creation to new creation. And the reason you have to have a new creation is because the second piece of the scripture is the fall, Genesis 3 to 11. If Genesis 1 and 2, along with other texts that describe creation, talk about how God made everything that exists, well, why isn't the perfect, very good world where every human person created in God's image is essentially serving as the hands, the feet, the mouthpieces of God, which was God's intention when God created men and women in his image and said, fill the earth. It was to have visible representatives of who God is, of who the invisible God is to the rest of creation. And then humanity's vocation was to care for creation itself and essentially serve as priests for the true living God. Well, that's all disrupted by the fall. So you have the stories of Adam and Eve. We have Cain killing Abel. We have Noah's Ark. And then the story of the Tower of Babel along with genealogies. The function of Genesis 3 to 11 is to describe, again, why the very good world that we have isn't what we find. And in fact, as Paul will say in the New Testament, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, every single human being that we ever have ever met and ever will meet is in need of God's grace. That's what the fall teaches. And we also find out that creation itself has been marred. God's answer to that is God calls a people to himself. Now notice the scriptures, I have it drawn this way. Genesis 1 to 11 is a universal story. All people are present in Genesis 1 to 11. It's a picture of the whole earth, all families, all people, all nations. All the different categories that we divide ourselves into today, they're all present here, but all in need of God's grace. Therefore, God calls one family, Abram and Sarah, to be the means and their descendants to be the means by which God is going to redeem the nation. So the scriptures, the Old Testament moves from a universal story of everyone to a particular focus Again, there's other nations show up in Israel's story, but the focus is on one particular family, which then becomes a nation. That's Israel, because Israel is going to be the means by which God redeems the world. It goes back to Abraham, uh, Genesis 12, 3, through you, all families will be blessed. And we'll see when we get to the Sinai covenant that God calls Israel to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In other words, God's witnesses to the rest of the nation, to the reality of who God is in preparation for the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. And then notice when we get to the church that I have the, the, the story expands where particular, this is Israel. And then once we get to Jesus, the Messiah, his life, death, and then his resurrection, Jesus then sends forth the church in the power of the Holy Spirit to make disciples of all nations. So after focusing from Genesis 12 to Malachi on a particular nation through whom the Messiah, Jesus, was going to manifest, the risen Christ then sends the power of the whole, through the power of the Holy Spirit, sends 
God's people to reach the nations. And that's the church. And the church is reconnecting Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. The kingdom knocks down boundaries that separate people in God's salvation is now proclaimed to the whole earth with an ethos of go. In the Old Testament, essentially to find out the truth about who God is, persons had to come to Israel to find out, with very few exceptions like Jonah and a couple other places where people go outside the boundaries of the land. But let's back up here and get back to the Old Testament just for a couple of minutes. Now, when we look at the Old Testament, of course, God calls Abraham and Israel's ancestors, and that would be Abraham and Sarah, right? Isaac and Rebecca, and then Jacob, and he has uh, multiple wives and partners that gives the 12 tribes of Israel. The big salvation story in the Old Testament, since this is a quick overview, is the exodus from Egypt and the Sinai Covenant, where God shows his grace. God does for Israel what no other God does. God comes in on the side of the oppressed, the suffering, his people, and delivers them from a superpower, that's grace, and the response to grace, this is going to be both Old and New Testament, is going to be faithfulness, which the Old Testament in the Torah defines as love for God and then loving your neighbor as yourself. That ethic is going to hold all the way into the New Testament. So what is the biblical ethic? It's love God and love your neighbor as yourself. God then brings God's redeemed people from Israel Egypt into the land, and the land of Canaan serves as essentially the, the God's work on the planet in advance of Jesus' coming, and Jerusalem becomes a critical city, and that's going to be the place where Jesus ends up being crucified, but it becomes the place where God abides in the temple, which is moving Mount Sinai through the tabernacle. It then locates permanently, eventually, during Solomon's time at Jerusalem where there's a temple. And then the other big piece, just going quickly through the Old Testament, is God has to send prophets because God's people in the land and in the temple are unfaithful. Instead of loving God, they practice idolatry and syncretistic practices where they worship other gods along with Yahweh. And then they practice injustice against their neighbors. So God sends the prophets to call God's people back, but also to point ahead to a time in which there's going to be a new king, a new covenant, the perfect priest, all of those pieces. Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. Jesus is the son of David. He's the long-awaited human representative that was going to come and reconstitute Israel. And Jesus does what Israel couldn't do. Jesus lives the perfect life. He reconstitutes Israel with 12 disciples. And again, I can go on and on, but essentially Jesus lives the life that Israel as a whole was unable to do and then dies on a cross for sins, for injustice, for illness, for all of the effects of the fall. But it's not the end. God raises Jesus from the dead to declare his victory. That's why we have the whole story moving this way. This is the climax, right? And then, as already said, Jesus sends forth the church, and we serve as Jesus' witnesses in anticipation of new creation. So that's the Bible in a little longer than five minutes, but I was close. That's the whole Bible in about, what is that, about eight minutes. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear about them. I hope this is helpful. If I can serve you in any way, uh, reach out to me. You can reach me in the comments, or you can reach out directly to me at deepdivespirituality at gmail.com. I'll see you next time.